Thank you very much, Annette, and thank you very much for having me here. It's wonderful to be back at Bond. I love being at Bond. I think it's a wonderful environment to, to be learning and be thinking about the big issues. So it's fantastic to have this opportunity to, to think about gender and diversity in, in the case of my presentation and governance from a cross-disciplinary perspective. I've put the first picture up there to show that I'm an optimist, uh, despite the topic. Uh, and the case study that I'm about to cover, I'm going to start from a position of optimism um, and then quickly move into the club. For those of you who haven't had the opportunity to read David Williamson's famous play from 1977, I was reading a paper the other day by Gideon Haig who referenced it in, in the context of sports governance today to say, where, where are we at? This is what was presented in 77, and is it any different today? He quoted an unnamed sports administrator uh, to, that said, you look at these boards and committees, and it's always the same set of white male faces from the same schools, the same universities, the s and the same metropolitan circles. Where is the cultural diversity, the regional diversity, and social diversity? And Gideon's point was, if you look at the National Sporting Organisation boards today, it's really not too different from what we were seeing in 77. And that's not really good. So from a gender perspective, I will limit the, the diversity conversation today just to gender because that's what I'm looking at for my PhD research. I started with a position in 2013 when the Sports Commission brought out the Winning Edge program. And one of the elements to the whole suite of governance is to have 40% of women on national sporting organisation boards. And they've tied it into funding. So for the first time, that creates not just a target, but an actual quota to have 40% of women on boards. And that's lovely. Um, and what I am looking at is the suggestion that that would lead to better integrity outcomes. I want to know why that would be the case and how a gender mix on the boards would lower the risk of integrity threats to sport. So the million dollar question is how do you do that? How do you isolate gender? Well, what I did was go out and speak to 12 women, it's phenomenology, the lived experience, and I tried to get, at, at least within my cohort of 12 women, a diverse bunch that I could speak to. And they were either currently sitting on a, a, a national and or an international level board. They ranged in age, that's not particularly diverse, probably 35 to 65, um, but at least that's, that's the group I had available to me. They had a whole range of different family situations. They were some choosing not to be married because they were essentially married to their sports administration roles. Some of them were trying to juggle partners and kids and a whole variety of different family situations. Some of them were elite athletes in their younger days and have now gone onto boards. Some had decided that they were going to have a kind of professional sports administration career in a sense. It might be unpaid, but uh, they were dedicated to that role. And other people work outside sport altogether. Some of these women had no involvement with sport except perhaps a passing interest. They had a whole range of different professional backgrounds. I deliberately tried to choose people, uh, which is quite difficult, not just lawyers. Uh, there's a ridiculous number of lawyers on sports boards and then we need to have some diversity in that respect. Um, there were gay and straight women. I wanted to have diversity there insofar as they were willing or able to tell me. Uh, geographic locations, that was a bit difficult in the sense that there is a um, total lack of women from regional areas. I couldn't get, find a single woman on a national sporting organisation body that comes from a regional area, but I could find them from a, a range of different capital cities if you look hard enough, not just from Sydney and Melbourne. That took some work. And then of course I wanted them to be representing different sports. I wanted them to be sitting on sports boards that might be individual sports as well as team sports. I wanted them to be at the high end of male professional organised sports as well as those smaller sports you only hear about during the Olympics and the Commonwealth Games. So that gave me an opportunity to talk to women from a whole range of sport perspectives, which was helpful. In my PhD, um, I look at the research sitting behind whether or not having more women on sports boards is a good thing. But for the purpose of our 
20, 25 minutes today, I'm going to ask you to take a leap of faith and assume that the research sits there and having more women in sports leadership and sports boards is a good thing. Happy to work with me on that? And we'll take that assumption and we'll go with it and then we'll say, well, that's great. How do we achieve our aim then of putting more talented women into these decision-making positions in sport? How? We agree that it's a good thing. What do we do about it? So I thought, and it has a lot of echoes from Merrilee's position today, <coughs> is this idea of an ethics of care approach to merit. And I think you can hear a lot of the same language from Merrilee's presentation this morning that the ethics of care approach uses, where you talk about caring, transparency, openness, authenticity, fairness, honesty. That sounds very lovely, because I think we need to turn on its head this idea that the current system is a merit-based position. It's totally not. It's reliant on a system of inequality. We have had years, hundreds of years, to have, uh, we, and we're all beneficiaries of a system of colonialisation, colonialisation, racism, sexism in place that allows us to all have the education that we have and the ability to have the jobs that we have, earn what we do, to travel the way we do because of the place and time that we were born in. So recognising that, an ethics of care approach um, would have you think about sport in a different way. Some of you might be thinking, I've never heard of ethics of care, I don't know anything about it, but you may actually have done. The most famous scenario is this one developed by Peter Singer. It's about the dr drowning child. So bear with me, I'll just remind you about it and tell you for the first time, those who haven't heard about it. The drowning child scenario says, there you are, dressed to the nines. You've got your lovely leather skirt and your new pair of shoes and your handbag. You're walking along past a lake and you see a child drowning. What do you do? The child is not your child. You didn't cause the child to drown. You didn't push them in the, the water. Um, but what do you do about it? There's no one else around. What do you do? Hopefully everyone in the room agrees with me that you jump in even though you've got your new shoes and your new leather skirt and you'd save the child. Is there anyone here that wouldn't? <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> that's good. So Peter Singer says, well, that's a very normal reaction. To hell with those new shoes, new handbag, new skirt, whatever, you're going to save that child. Okay. He says, is our feeling of care in that setting reliant on the geographic proximity to that child? Hmm? What about, and I've given you a picture there of uh, kids in Indonesia in the slums playing football. What about those kids in another part of the world? They're drowning in a sense. That might be poverty, it might be an illness, an injury. Something is going on, some kind of natural catastrophe. There's a war, something's happening. And there are kids that need our help. If we receive a letter tomorrow from UNICEF that says please donate $50, do we say, well, they're over there. They're a drowning child. I don't need to worry about them. I only worry about the one that's drowning right in front of me because I can do something about that. But you can do something about it with your $50. Peter Singer's argument is, if you were prepared to ruin that $300 pair of shoes jumping in the lake to save that child, why don't you send $300 to the child that's in Bangladesh or Indonesia or Somalia or wherever? Do you see? That's the ethical dilemma. So if we take that thinking, how about we do a bit of caring and give up some of our otherwise um, achieved entitlements that weren't really because of something good that we did. We've just inherited this system that's created inequalities. Then how do we see that in a sports governance environment? Our merit system was founded on 100 years of inequality. So why instead don't we start with a 50-50 position? The Sports Commission is saying 40, but the community is represented in, from a gender perspective of 50-50. So an ethics of care perspective then, and this has also been, uh, it was a question I asked of the women in my PhD studies and they thought, it was a fair position to start with. That rather than trying to do a representational model, how many women do you have playing your sport? In football, for example, the, the 
percentage currently is 22. So rather than saying, well, there's 22% of women currently sp playing sport today, so therefore we should have representation in a sports governance perspective of 22 women, percentage of women on leadership positions. Ethics of care says, no, no. It's where you want to be in the future. It's Merrilee's example of where we are in 2040, 2050. Where are we going in the future? How do we overcome this system of inequality to make it better? Then we start with the community. The community in Australia has 50-50 men and women. Right? Rather than taking it to the other extreme, which some, some people might argue is that, well, because it was so unfair all these years, we should actually make, tip it the other way and have more women than men on boards. I'm not arguing for that. I'm saying an ethics of care just starts with a 50-50 point of view. What do you think? Is that unreasonable? Some people might want to argue in the break that it's unreasonable. We'll see. Let's have a look at what's happening in football. Okay, case study, the FFA, Football Federation of Australia. So, we have the embarrassing scenario that one of the most corrupt organisations in the world, FIFA, is coming down under to tell us that our governance structure is not very good. I think that's a bit embarrassing, <laughs> don't you? Like Transparency International that focuses on anti-corruption across all sectors, all industries, has done a specific report into corruption in football for around FIFA. And that organisation is coming to us and saying, I'm sorry, you fellas, actually, mostly fellas, in football in Australia are not doing it very well and you need to step up your game. Embarrassing. What's FIFA's requirement? That each of the national bodies need to, at a minimum, be constituted in accordance with the principles of representative democracy and taking into account the importance of gender equality in football. That's written into FIFA's statutes and that's what we're not in compliance of. FIFA has written this in their statutes. <laughs> I don't know if you, you kind of get the importance of this. FIFA has managed to get this, but we can't get it right. What have we got? What do we call democratic representation? Okay, so we have two bodies. The FIFA Congress, they vote for the independent FFA board members. So the board is constituted of nine, six elected and three appointed. So at the moment, that conversation is not on the table about how to constitute the board because they say they've legally been elected, leave that discussion alone. The only little side note I've added in there is during this whole discussion about how to have proper democratic representation in football, we've actually lost a woman from the board in terms of number. We've lost two women and replaced it by one. So in this time, things have actually gotten worse on the board. But park that. Well, what FIFA is interested in is our Congress. So there's 10 spots under the Constitution. At the moment, there are no women. The 10 spots are made up of nine for the state associations. New South Wales has two bodies if you're trying to work out from a federated system how nine works. New South Wales is big, it has a northern New South Wales and, and other New South Wales body. And the A-League clubs have one vote. That's, that's how the constitution is currently written. And FIFA says, no good. Not representative, let me go back quickly, not represent, representational democracy and doesn't include gender equality at all. There's no reference to gender equality. So. What's been happening? This crisis in football, if you haven't been following the news, they threatened, FIFA came down and said, we're going to dismiss the whole FFA board. We're going to replace it with a normalisation committee. I have to know what FIFA thinks is normal, but anyway, leave that alone. That's their terminology. And in November, they had a big vote of the Congress. They failed to come up with a new structure. The proposal on the table was nine for the member associations, four for the A-Leagues and one which they called special interest, special interest. The PFA that I've referred to there is the Players Association. So that's the organisation that looks after the professional athletes, the professional footballers in, in Australia. Tuesday, um, because that failed in November, Tuesday FFA have asked all the stakeholders to come together for 
a meeting to discuss the composition for what FIFA have allowed them to create, which is a Congress Review Working Group. Now, don't get mistaken, we're not talking about solutions on Tuesday. On Tuesday, we're talking about the composition of the body that we'll talk about solutions later. So this is an opportunity for us. This is our forum, Combined Brains, at Bond University today is that we can come up with some solutions that can be taken to the table. So I'm hoping that you're with me on this, that once I've set out the scenario, there's going to be some great minds coming up with how we can come up with some solutions together. The key challenge, however, is amending the FFA constitution. The current 10 people, all male Congress, must vote on any proposal with more than 75% of the members present. So eight out of 10 of all the men sitting around at Congress at the moment, remember, nine from the state associations, one from the A-League, vote for a significant change or to put themselves out of a job. Asking turkeys to vote on the menu for Christmas. That's a bit of a stumbling block. How do we get them to do that? Well, first of all, some of you may not be familiar with what A-League is. Let's just talk about that. That one vote that in November was sitting there talking about having an extra three votes to make it four. This is the Professional Men's League. This is the top level of men's football in Australia, run by the FFA. It commenced in 2005 and there are 10 teams currently. Nine based in Australia and one, the, the Wellington Phoenix, based in New Zealand. There's a couple of questions about the A-Leagues that I have. Teams, the, the ownership of the leagues and their relationship with the W <coughs> League clubs. Foreign ownership. Now, my first question is, and I don't know how you feel about this, what do we think about foreign owned clubs having a say in our sport, in Australian sport? You might be fine with it, I don't know, it might be completely okay. But you can see there that half the clubs are foreign owned. I'd be interested to know whether people think that's a problem or not. I just flag it. I think it's a bit odd to have international people having a say in our sport, particularly community level sport. The W League Club, I'm glad you mentioned the W League, it hasn't come up in the constitution anywhere, but it exists. It's been around since 2008. Nine, nine teams, except Canberra United, which is owned by and, and run by the Canberra ACT state body then all the rest of them have an affiliation with the A-League teams. So you can see the, the ownership there. There's this lovely body that's floating around, a nice little cosy bunch of nine, which is called the Australian Football Clubs Association, which is the A-League bosses. Now this doesn't properly exist as a, as a body that has a, a memorandum of understanding with the FFA. There are no female chairs or CEOs of the A-League clubs. And there's absolutely no reference to the women or the W League and its objectives, but it says that it represents the professional clubs, both the A League and the W League, which it clearly doesn't. It has no interest in doing that and it says it in its own objectives, in its constitution. But it wants to have either four or five votes in Congress and says, but we represent the women as well. So the women don't need a separate vote. We'll take care of that. We're looking after them. That's fine. My proposal, and I don't know what you think about this, is that if we could create a body that's called the licensees group, which is the licensees for both the W League and the A Leagues teams, all the clubs together, we create this new body, or FFA says the existing body has to include the, the W League clubs, then you could give a vote for that body to decide on how, who's gonna go forward to the Congress. So I'm suggesting that if all the clubs got together, the A League and the W League, and so you've got two votes. If you're Brisbane Raw, for example, you've got a team in both the A League and the W League, so you get two votes to decide on who goes to Congress. Because if you get four in the end, I'm suggesting, then two of them should be, out of the four, two should be for the A League reps, and two should be for the W League teams. Seems fair from an ethics of care 50-50 proposal, doesn't it? that you get your votes, and then if you're a team that only has an A-League, you only get one vote, like Wellington Phoenix, sorry our New Zealand friends, only one, until you can step it up and get a women's team, and then you can have two votes. 
but then otherwise the Canberra United only gets one vote. Now, of course, the A-League clubs don't want Canberra United to have any vote at all because they say you're a state association. That effectively gives the state association another vote. I don't know if that's a real issue and it certainly doesn't assist. If you look at the state associations, there's nine of them as I mentioned, there's 56 state board positions available, women only hold 10 and none are chairs or CEOs. I've got a picture there of Heather Reid who was the only CEO of a football association in Australia. She was there for 11 years, she's retired and hasn't been replaced with a woman anywhere in Australia. So it doesn't look too good from where are the women coming through from a member association perspective. So I'm wondering, what do we do about this? Do we require the, the state associations to nominate a male and a female for their nine votes? Or is there another mechanism structurally that we can create? Is it time to create a riot? Well, that doesn't really sound very caring uh, from an ethical care perspective. But, the, but this, I think it's time to shake things up. And I'd be really interested and welcome your views and ideas on how we can do it. Mm -hmm.